This evening, uh, our passage is in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're really going to look at just the one verse, but I thought I would read it in the context. Certainly, everything that God has to tell us in His Word is encouraging, and it would be great if we could read the whole thing. We obviously can't, but let me read for you at least these um, couple of portions, these couple of paragraphs. 2 Timothy 1, beginning in verse 1 through verse 14. Paul writes to Timothy, and this, I believe, was... Um, during the time he was imprisoned in Rome, perhaps his second imprisonment just prior to his execution. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and I am sure that it is in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. May the Lord bless his word to us this evening, again, particularly verse 7. Now, again, we have been looking at the promises of God, and certainly we don't want to get tired of dwelling on them, and I thought perhaps if I just pointed out a couple of different things, maybe two things about these promises in general, uh, it might again cause us to focus more carefully on what we're looking at this evening. First of all, you need to remember that every promise that God has made to you is infinitely valuable and infinitely precious because each one of them, whether they be the physical blessings or especially the spiritual ones, are exactly what you need in order finally to arrive in heaven, which I hope you would agree with me is the greatest blessing we could possibly receive. And that by itself would make them precious But remember, too, that each one of these comes to you and to me at infinite cost. The price that was paid was the life of God's only Son. Again, as the table of the Lord reminds us, each blessing was purchased through His precious blood. If Jesus had not been crucified, we would not have any of these things, certainly not heaven. And secondly, remember that each promise is also precious because it is undeserved. The price that was paid is infinitely precious, but remember the one that it was, or the, those that it was purchased for are infinitely undeserving of these things. Each of us here deserves hell, not heaven. It would be infinitely precious if we were neutral, but how much more so when we are guilty of infinite sin, and yet the Lord purchased these for us through the blood of His Son. So these are blessings we don't want to take for granted, not only because of what they actually will bring to us eventually, which is heaven, 
but also because we are so undeserving of such a great price paid for us. Now with this in mind, last time, remember, we looked at that blessed promise of guidance. We realize it's not always easy to know what it is that we are supposed to do, what it is that God made us for. We need the Lord's guidance to find our purpose in life. If we don't have purpose, we really don't have a reason to live. People who lose their purpose oftentimes um, don't want to live. We need to know. But God actually promises to give us this guidance. And we saw that there are several ways that he does this. He promises that he will guide us through his providence. The Lord makes us a certain way. He gives us certain gifts and he withholds other gifts. He opens particular doors and he closes other doors according to his will. God guides us and shows us what he has made us for. The Lord also guides us through his word to show us how to do what he has made us to do in a way that brings him glory. Certainly it's not enough to know what God wants us to do. We need to make sure that when we do those things, we do them in a way that's honoring to him and not just fulfilling to us as Christians. The most fulfilling thing should be to do them in a way that is pleasing to him. The Lord has promised to guide us through his spirit to bring scriptures to our minds, to show us how to apply those scriptures, even to give us the desire to do what he says and what he has made us to do. And of course, we also saw that the Lord has promised to give us guidance, even when you don't want to go the direction that he actually calls you to go, God is faithful to discipline you, to make sure you get back on the path. And even though we might not like it, when we consider the end, we have to realize that that also is infinitely precious. These are things that you could never buy, things that you could never get God to give you, but God has offered to give it to you freely through his son, Jesus Christ. And these are great blessings. But knowing what it is that you are to do and how you are to do it, even if God gives to you certain incentives to make sure that you do it, isn't really all that you need. You need more. You also need courage, the courage to do these things, especially when you realize that the Lord calls you to do things that aren't altogether comfortable. It shouldn't surprise us that God promises to give us courage as well. It's included in that package that God has for us, everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has made every provision for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this evening, let's consider two things that I think work together quite well uh, to ensure us or to ensure to us God's uh, intent or his purpose to protect us and to give us the kind of courage we need to do his will. The two things are this. First of all, the Lord gives you the reason to be courageous, the grounds to be courageous through his promise of protection. And secondly, he has also promised to give you courage within by strengthening your heart through his Holy Spirit. So first of all, the Lord gives you a reason to be courageous through his promise of protection. You need to know that God is for you. Because if you didn't know that, if you didn't know that God had promised to watch over you and to keep you, it really wouldn't matter whether you felt courageous or not. The fact is you wouldn't be safe, but God has promised to protect you. He has promised that he would be a wall of protection to his people, and that includes you. David writes in, in our psalm, actually the reason I read this psalm is because it is full of promises, full of statements of God's promise of protection. David writes, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. You see, David didn't have to be afraid of those who were coming against him because he realized that God had promised to protect him. And again, we're going to plumb in, in, into this a little bit further. The Lord also says through the prophet Joel, again, a very encouraging passage, Joel 3, verse 16. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. 
and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. The fact is God offers himself to you as a fortress. He wants you to trust in him. Certainly if somebody promises to give you something and you don't believe them and you don't act upon that promise, you're really shaming the person. You're, you're saying that they're not trustworthy. You can't believe what they're saying. God doesn't obviously want you to treat him in that way. He wants you to believe his promise and act upon it. The Lord has promised that he will watch over you even during those times when you are most vulnerable and can't look out for yourself. And even, if, of course, if you could, if you didn't have God's promise of protection, there are things out there far too powerful for you that you would never be able to protect yourself from. But God promises that he will protect you even when you are most vulnerable. Again, in Psalm 3, verse 5, David writes, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. It's a very dangerous thing when you're surrounded by enemies to sleep because your enemy might come while you're asleep and kill you. But David said that he had the confidence to wake up again because God was protecting him. David goes on to say that the Lord has promised to fight for you against your enemies. He will be your defender. He will be your champion. He says in verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Now realize as well that God has promised not only that he is going to protect your life protect your body, as it were, your physical life. He's also promised to protect that which is much more precious, and that is your soul. Peter writes that you are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If you have trusted the Lord, this is true of you. And that's why the people of God have been able to say, Isaiah 12, verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. God has made a promise to protect you. And that is an ironclad guarantee of your safety. Since he never lies. That doesn't mean that you should... Be fast and easy with your life or do things that, that might threaten your life, like running out on the freeway or sometimes uh, some of the recreations we choose, like skydiving and things like that, might be somewhat dangerous. Don't put God to the test, but realize that God is there to watch out for you. And God is not going to allow anything on earth to harm you, at least before that time in which he intends to bring you to heaven. Certainly he will allow no power of hell to touch you. You are safe. Now, we should stop and, and ask a question here. I mean, God has made, I think, quite plain that he is there to watch over you, there to protect you, and he's not going to let anything harm you. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to his disciples, he sent them out. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Not a sparrow falls from the sky apart from God. He is going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. But having those promises, does that mean that you will never worry? Now, it certainly means that you should never have to worry because if you have to worry, that means God is not trustworthy, but that's not true. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to worry because we're all faulty. You know, we all have our, our sin that we have to deal with. Anything can have the potential to tempt you to be afraid, but you don't need to be afraid. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't be afraid because fear is, as I mentioned before, sin. Fear is actually a lack of trust in God. The Lord commands you not to be afraid, not to be anxious. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That means don't be afraid that your needs will be met. Don't be afraid or don't worry about where your next meal is going to come from. Don't worry that God is not going to take care of you or that people are going to harm you. God is there to protect you. 
Now, when God is for you, you shouldn't worry even when the situation all around you is screaming at you to do so. I mean, think about the situation that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in. They had plenty of reasons, we might say, plenty of good reasons why they should have worried when they were being threatened with being cast into the furnace of fire. But do you know what? They did not worry. The fact is they trusted in God. When they were threatened, they said this to the king, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. You know, when they said that to the king, the king didn't like that, and so he had the furnace heated seven times hotter. It was so hot that the people who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace, they died in their attempt to do so. And yet, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not die. They believed that God would protect them. Lord uh, told the king that basically he's either going to bring us out of the fire or he's going to bring us through the fire. But either way, God was going to deliver them. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what God did. God did what he said he would do. And that really shouldn't be a surprise to us. It shouldn't be in, in our particular lives as well. Now, Paul also had plenty of reason to worry while he was a prisoner in Rome, but he didn't worry. Again, in, in our text in 2 Timothy 1, in verse 12, he says to Timothy, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. He wasn't ashamed of what he had done, even though he was a prisoner. And he certainly wasn't afraid of what the Romans could do to him. He knew that God was able to guard what was most precious to him until that day. Nothing would ultimately harm him. As a matter of fact, the worst thing that could happen to him was that the Lord would take him to glory. And that, he wrote, was very much better. And if you're convinced of that as well, that nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus then it would also be true of you that nothing can make you afraid. May the Lord give us grace to apprehend that kind of promise. Now, that's where the second part comes in. That's where the spirit of power comes in because God has also promised to give you courage by strengthening your heart through His Spirit actually to apprehend these promises and to apply them because promises won't do you any good unless you believe them unless you put your confidence in God. But the Lord has promised to give you His Spirit to help you to do precisely that. The Spirit, as we've already seen, is able to bring the Scriptures to your mind. He is able to bring God's promises to your mind and apply them when you need them the most to bring you peace. Jesus says in John 14, verses 25 through 27, but the Helper... Oh, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You see, the reason why, of course, Christ gives us His Holy Spirit is to give us comfort. And one thing that we need to comfort our souls is certainly the peace of God, to know that we are safe. Well, the Spirit is able to bring these promises to your mind. He's able to bring them to your attention. And He is also able to convince you that God actually is trustworthy. You can believe Him. You can rest in Him. You can rest safely, even as David writes in Psalm 31, verse 24, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. The reason why David could say that and the reason, of course, why it can also be true of you is because the Spirit of God is able to give you that kind of courage. He works directly to bring that courage within your heart by strengthening your love for the Lord, and your faith in Him. I hope you see by now the connection between love and faith. If we love the Lord, we will certainly trust Him as well. And trust is the essence of faith. 
And that's again why Paul tells Timothy in our passage, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Now, sometimes we might think that we're just too weak to be able to receive the promises of God, too weak for the Lord to give us strength. But one thing we need to understand that works in our favor, and that is the fact that when you are the weakest, that is when God shows himself to be strongest. Remember that Paul wrote to the Corinthians about the trial that he was going through. That trial was a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him because of the revelations that God had given to him. And Paul prayed three times that God might deliver him. But the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And so Paul concluded, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. See, it doesn't matter that we are weak. The weaker we are, the stronger the Lord can show himself to be. And oftentimes, the Lord will bring us to the end of our strength so that he might show us just how strong he is and how strong he is able to make us. The Lord has promised to give you help. The Lord has promised that he will protect you. The Lord has promised to give you his Holy Spirit to convince you that he will protect you. But there is something that you need to do in order to receive this help. And that is, you do need to trust him, and you do need to wait upon him in prayer. Remember again that a promise isn't going to do you any good unless you believe it, and unless you act on it. You need to understand that there is no lack of power in God. He can certainly do whatever it is he promises. Sometimes I think we struggle at the point of whether God is willing but you see, that's the whole point of a promise. We, we do understand that God is able. We know that from his omnipotence. But is he willing? And how can we know whether God is willing? Well, it's only through his promise. The promise tells us that as a matter of fact, God is willing to do what he is able to do. He says through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31, he gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases strength or power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. David writes, on the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. So if you want this grace, if you want this strength to have courage in the Lord, the first thing, of course, you need to do is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are not his child, none of the promises apply to you. You have to trust in Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. But then secondly, you do need to believe that what God says is true. What he has promised, he is able to do, and he is willing to do. Again, that's what a promise means. And what is it that you can do if you have this help? Well, you can do whatever it is that God calls you to do, especially that most difficult work of being his witnesses in the face of a world that is hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke writes in the book of Acts, in Acts 4, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You remember that this comes at a time when um, they had been arrested and threatened and then released. And so that they wouldn't be intimidated by those powers that be, they prayed that God would give them boldness, and the Lord, as a matter of fact, did just that. They trusted that God's promise was true, that he would protect them. They called upon the Lord for strength, and he gave them that strength, and they went out and proclaimed Jesus Christ wherever they went. That same help is available to you if you will trust the Lord. 
Well, may the Lord help each one of us to do that and to receive his blessing through faith in his word, through his son, Jesus Christ. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us apply his word to our hearts.